streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, via IBC Instagram. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Quaja, consultant bariatric surgeon, co-founder of the IBC, and director of IBC Global Education, based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London, and Christchurch, Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Mal Foby from the United States, and will be moderated by Professor David Kerrigan from the United Kingdom, and Professor Rudolf Weiner from Germany, Dr. Haisam Fawal from Lebanon, and Dr. Wa Yang from China. And I want to start off by presenting my co-chair today, Professor Matias Fobi, who needs no introduction. He is from the United States and India. He is Director of Clinical Affairs and Research in Mohawk Bariatric and Robotics in Dore, India. He's also Clinical Professor of Surgery, Sri Aurobindo Medical College and Postgraduate Institute in Dore, India, President of IFSO 2008-2009, President of ASMBS Foundation 2006 through 2008. It's a great honor to have you with us today. Thank you. I also want to present my good friend, Professor Rudolf Weiner from Germany, Professor of Surgery at Johann Wolfgang von Gott, University of Frankfurt am Main, Germany, and founding president of the German Society for Bariatric Surgery, CAADIP, if so, European chapter, president to 2010 20, 2012, if so, president 2014 2015, and president, if so, World Congress 2011. Rudolf, it's great to have you. I do. Gracias. Also, I want to present uh, our good friend, Professor David Kerrigan from the United Kingdom. He is Professor of Surgery and founder of Phoenix Health, one of the leading providers of bariatric and metabolic surgery in the United Kingdom, president of the British Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society, an expert advisor in bariatrics for the General Medical Council and Royal College of Surgeons and the Irish Medical Council. Great to have you here. Great. Right. Lovely to be here again, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Haisam Fawal from Lebanon. He is president of the Pan-Arab Society of Metabolic Bariatric Surgery, clinical assistant professor of surgery and surgical review corporation, master surgeon in metabolic and bariatric surgery, chair of IFSO, Middle East, North Africa chapter, corporate and finance committee, executive board member and treasurer of IFSO, Middle East, North Africa chapter. Great to have you here. Also want to present Dr. Hua Yang from China, a consultant bariatric surgeon, International Bariatric Center, the first affiliated hospital of Jinan University, Guangzhou, China, scientist, the State Key Laboratory of Pharmaceutical Biotechnology, LKS Faculty of Medicine, and the University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong, China. He's also president-elect of Young Ifso Vice President, Jinan University Institute of Obesity and Metabolic Disorders, and director of Chinese Obesity and Metabolic Surgery, Collaborative, Comms Collaborative. Welcome to this event. I'm going to now pass it on to Professor Malfobi so he can present our first speaker. You're on mute, Mel. You're muted. Muted. Okay. No, you're not. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Good. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be part of this outstanding panel to discuss a very interesting topic, which is very timely, controversial, but I think it's going to make a lot of difference for those who suffer from morbid obesity. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Rodledge, a classmate from the USA, who introduced the procedure we're going to be talking about today, has spent most of his life popularizing it, and uh, it is becoming, I think it's about the second most popular procedure done outside of the United States and the third most popular procedure done worldwide right now. Uh, I don't need to say much about Robert. You all know him. He has a cantankerous character, very infectious, but he believes strongly about 
what he's doing. And I tell you, Robert, take the stage and tell us because <laughs> you have made a difference in bariatric surgery. <laughs> Many people are doing what you have preached directly or indirectly. And I say that with a lot of humiliation because at the ASMBS virtual seminar last week, I noticed that most of the surgeons were doing gastric bypass with an elongated BP limb. <laughs> so you can take credit for that. Robert, go ahead. Um, <laughs> sir, it is my honor to have your introduction. You and I have been friends and brothers for many years. You're uh, a leader in the world and to have your kind words uh, is, uh, is a tremendous uh, feeling for me. I have an opportunity to talk to you again sometime because you taught me something else recently when we uh, spoke. And uh, so I won't take any more time, but uh, thank you for the introduction. And I look forward to my talk and I'll go ahead and share my screen now, but thank you, Dr. Pobey. Welcome. Okay, I'm talking about the history of MGB and I start off with this uh, photograph, a slide from Google of all the places I've been teaching the mini gastric bypass over the past few years. And uh, it is very uh, heartening after the difficult times that I went through for the first 10 years of the MGB when it was just a little child. And now as Dr. Phobia says, it's growing. So that's exciting for me. I couldn't fit uh, Australia on the picture, but I've also been there. and. It's interesting to see it taking off there, but let me talk a little bit about MGB today. <clears throat> I will point out that we now have 20 year data that you can uh, talk to patients uh, on my uh, Facebook page. Um, there are five or 6,000 uh, MGB patients talking about their MGB every day. And I thought I'd just brag about a couple. Here's a patient who's 20 years post-op. I had the MGB in 2000. And uh, I weigh 252 pounds and I weigh 135. And of course, it's not appropriate to just show individual patients, but I'll do just two more if I may. Um, I weigh 328 in uh, 2003, now 124. And um, <clears throat> then one more, 11 years out, who is doing well, but quote, I don't agree with you politically, but I still carry your torch. So um, it's pretty exciting. I'll give you a little bit of background of history in general. Those of you who are younger and don't recall this, the uh, peptic ulcer disease back in my day, in uh, Dr. Phoebe's day, was a near uh, epidemic uh, uh, proportion and we were surgically treating it. But the surgical treatment began with kind of a Bill Roth one type operation, resecting the area of the ulcer, which had a high mortality and a relatively high recurrence rate. Um, in those early days, Dr. Mayo and other surgeons, but Dr. Mayo in the United States began advocating something that they began calling the drainage procedure. And this is where I became kind of experienced with um, this early kind of operation. And it's, of course, just a Bill Roth too. I would like to point out and give thanks to my teachers. And of course, I, I bow to Dr. Phoebe as one of my teachers, but as a medical student, my teacher was a, a man named Lester Dragstadt. And Dr. Dragstadt um, was known because he was the basically developer of the truncal vagotomy and uh, pyloroplasty or antrectomy as a treatment for peptic ulcer disease. And uh, here is a famous quote of uh, the greatness of Dr. Dragstadt's efforts, uh, quoting him as an example for future generations and surgeons should always treasure that. And as I say, he took a great deal of criticism and he was my teacher. And I thought you might be interested to hear how the first truncal vagotomy was performed. My teachers, Dr. Dragstadt and Dr. Woodward, who was the chairman of my department of surgery in the medical school at the University of Florida, had a patient with a severe bleeding ulcer and was scheduled for a partial gastrectomy as a treatment because that was the treatment at the time. Dr. Dragstadt's idea is that decreasing the ulcer through truncal vagotomy was viewed with a lot of skepticism and bitter criticism, which I'm familiar with. <laughs> when the patient was told that he was scheduled for a partial gastrectomy and it was explained to him, he apparently yelled out, that operation killed my father. And my brother who has had it also says he wishes he was dead. 
So through a, a period of discussion, they decided to perform in 1943, the first vagotomy as part of the treatment for peptic ulcer disease. And ultimately uh, they put, reported on 400 cases in 1947 and gradually through the next decades, it become, became the standard. These two men were my teachers and they taught me to fight for what I believe in. And now as Dr. Phoebe has pointed out, sometimes I fight a little rougher than I should, but uh, my apologies. <laughs> 23 years ago now, I performed the first mini gastric bypass and I like to give a little introduction and then a story of the first MGB, which in some ways is like the first truncal vagotomy from my teachers. The early phase as again, as Dr. Phoebe uh, knows quite well, as he was one of my uh, few uh, kind uh, colleagues in, the, uh, in America, I was criticized because at the time it was routine to take out the gallbladder. And they said, this is wrong, what you're doing, you're not taking out the gallbladder. You may not remember, I was one of the early adopters of the laparoscopic Roux-en-Y. And in those days, we did a retrogastric and retrocolic approach. And uh, I see Dr. Phoebe shaking his head, yes, that was really difficult in those days. The, the Roux-en-Y laparoscopically in those days could be three, four, five, even six hours long. And I can recall one day I was in the operating room, I had ports all over the abdomen and this morbidly obese patient and one of my rogue colleagues stuck his head in and says, it looks like you've got Sputnik in there. <clears throat> so anyways, I was also criticized because the MGB was obviously a recapitulation of the old failed Mason gastric bypass and patients would suffer crippling bile reflux and the Bill Roth II caused cancer. And also, interestingly, I was told uh, when I presented for the first time that this was obviously a failed operation because the pouch was too big, not small, as it was supposed to be in the Roux and Y, and the gastrojejunostomy was too wide, and so patients would not lose weight. But maybe my most uh, enjoyable thing to look back on is I was bitterly criticized at the time because I used email and I had a website. <laughs> I still think that there's a reasonable number of bariatric surgeons who don't understand some basic general surgery. And I hope that people won't take that as a, too much of a criticism. But I'd like to point out that the Bill Roth II has been shown to be a good operation. It improves diabetes in general surgery. It improves cardiovascular disease and the risk of stroke. And I'll just do three slides on this topic in preparation for the details on the history. This is a nationwide population-based study comparing matched controlled patients showing that the Bill Roth II by itself in ulcer patients decreased the incidence of stroke, particularly protective in men and those over 65. Similarly, in the same kind of study from the entire country of Taiwan, it decreased heart disease by almost a quarter. And finally, in the same kind of study published several years before that, they found that those patients, exactly the same patients matched by age and comorbidities, if you had had peptic ulcer disease and a Bill Roth II surgery, that you had a 50% decrease in diabetes over a lifetime. So why did bariatric surgeons get so confused from the very beginning? Why did they respond so negatively, other than the fact that we're men and we tend to be somewhat pugnacious? Well, of course, it's related to the failure of Mason's first gastric bypass. Now, Mason was a great man and uh, contributed much to our science, and he is a leader that we follow, but the first gastric bypass violated one of the primary principles that we learned even in the early 1900s. You can't put a loop next to the esophagus, and of course, that's why the MGB puts the uh, anastomosis near the junction of the body and the antrum of the stomach, but there was a lot of confusion and still remains a good deal of confusion on this topic. <clears throat> but times are changing. And if you'll give me a, a moment, I'd just like to point out, here's the lap band, here is the MGB. And I'd like to point out uh, the uh, very good article published by Dr. Nasser and uh, from Israel showing that the MGB went from nothing to half of the cases in four year period in his study and the sleeve has dropped from almost all of the cases down to only a third and maybe even declining further around the world from what people tell me. And you might wonder why. <clears throat> well, what if one out of three patients fail and regain their weight? 
Here's a study from my friends in India. And this is almost 10,000 patients. And this was uh, asking the contributing hospitals from all over India to report on weight regain. And Sleeve, as you can see, regained their weight in uh, almost a third, Ruin Y 15%. And in this reported study, many of these skilled MGB surgeons, the weight regain was down to 3%. There is remaining a paradox, which I hope we'll deal with today, that MGB was born in controversy, and there still remains the question of bile reflux. Is it common or is it rare? Excess weight loss, is revision common, as said in the Y Omega trial, or rare, as in my and other series? What about marginal ulcer and deficiencies, et cetera? Here's an example of this problem where Dr. Lee, Kular, and my series show that significant reflux requiring revision is less than 1% or 2% versus a recent study from Australia showing it's 10%. And so what are the issues? And these are things I think worth talking about. But my assignment today is to talk about where this all began. And it's a short story. And I think it reminds me of Dr. Dragstat and what Dr. Woodward's story. It's very simple. I was a trauma surgeon, as I said, I was one of the first surgeons doing laparoscopic Roux and Y, and they were difficult. And in 1997, in the midst of this, I received a drug dealer who had been shot in the abdomen six times as a uh, attending in the ER. About nine o'clock on a Thursday night in September, 1997, I took that patient to the operating room. We identified multiple gunshot wounds to the stomach, the tail of the pancreas, and multiple loops of small bowel. What we did is standard general surgery. We did a distal gastrectomy, distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, and we repaired multiple loops of small bowel. Nothing special. I'm not a, I'm just a general surgeon. <clears throat> and then we repaired the, uh, the resection. And what we did, of course, is just routine general surgery. We did a anticholic bilroth 2 gastrojejunostomy with numerous other repairs. Nothing to it, standard. Um, and the patient ultimately did quite well. The next morning, I actually had scheduled a laparoscopic Roux and Y. My Roux and Y's, early laparoscopic Roux and Y's were difficult, dangerous, and occasionally suffered significant complications. I thought of the operation I had just done, which was a sick, seriously ill patient, which had gone quite smoothly. And I said to myself, I'll just do what I just did. That's the story of the MGB and the subsequent uh, quarter decade battle for the uh, result. Uh, the last time that I presented this, uh, I was asked why we called it a mini gastric bypass. And briefly, I'll mention that in those days, laparoscopic surgery was called minimally invasive surgery. So when I started talking to patients, I told them that what we were going to do was a collis gastroplasty with an anticholic Bill Roth II gastrojejunostomy. And they said, pardon? And that was a little hard to put on our business card. So we said it was a minimally invasive gastric bypass. And I shortened that ultimately to the mini gastric bypass. So I conclude then and, and get out of here early on my time uh, to say that uh, the Bill Roth II is routine general surgery. The Bill Roth II is a good safe operation unless it's done wrong. And I think that should be obvious. I think that the early surgery was done wrong and that's besmirch the ideas and the name of the MGB, but the MGB, when it's done well, can be quite good. And I'll summarize again, it's standard general surgery. The collis gastroplasty is explicitly not like a Ruin Y and not like a sleeve, although it's often confused because it's non-obstructive restriction. And we could talk about that. In addition, uniquely, I think of all the bariatric procedures, it's easily and routinely tailored to the individual patient from a thin diabetic to a super obese individual. And, and of course I'm biased, but I see the MGB as simple, elegant, effective, durable now for over 20 years, powerful, uniquely tailored to the patient and almost trivially easy to reverse or revise. And so then I'll uh, just quote here um, <laughs> that, um, I want to thank my friends worldwide who've invited me to come and teach. I want to thank my teachers, Dr. Dragstat, and remind us that we're not done yet. And a famous quote about Dr. Pavlov, he gesticulated as he spoke. He had a sense of humor and often provoked argument. 
Those who ventured to argue with him did so at their own risk, for he was a lively and passionate by nature and gave no quarter to anyone who argued with him. Many thanks, and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you all. Questions from our panelists? Uh, uh, maybe I can start. Um, yes. Robert, uh, nice to hear, to see you again. Sir. Um, maybe uh, the procedure um, looks easy, but uh, in my, in my personal experience, it isn't. Uh, so we, we learned, I, I started in 2004, and the principal, the principal, uh, the longest gastric tube, as you can do, a white anastomosis and not too long Billy Pankin limb. But different is what I learned, and maybe, maybe you can answer, the uncalibrated, sometimes very wide gastric sleeve pouch. Maybe this is a mistake. Ah. Because the background is 150, uh, 144 conversions I have done from MGB uh, to Rue and Y. And these, most of the cases have had the sleeve before, then we had the MGB, and we are not calibrated or not resized the sleeve. I think you, you're doing free-handed, uncalibrated, but maybe you can change it as a recommendation to have a really also calibrated uh, Narrow, not too wide, not too wide uh, sleeve like pouch. Yeah, you bring up a great question. And hello, Dr. Weiner. And again, as many of my hosts, you invited me to your um, center, and it was a pleasure to teach with you. And I know that your questions are quite bright, and you're right. Let me say we have done a study in India where we have increased the diameter of the gastric pouch progressively. And what we've done in our analysis now in 10 year data, it doesn't seem to make any difference in the outcome. Now the sleeve, it, when it's a dilated sleeve, remember they're a failed gastric bypass, sorry, they're a failed bariatric surgery. Any failed surgery, whether it's a lap band, a sleeve, a Ruin Y, or even an MGB, the amount of bypass necessary to get effect, in my opinion, needs to be greater. So uh, I think that it, it's certainly true you can trim the sleeve. And certainly if you have a large reservoir, that's different from having a, a relatively uh, equivalent to an esophagus type gastric pouch. What we think is the goal of the uh, MGB pouch is it's an extension of the esophagus. It's really nothing more than the old collis gastroplasty. But then we have heard many people who begin to creep into the idea, I wanna make it obstructive. I wanna make it narrow. And then we think that leads to pathologic cool. eating. We don't want to have pathologic eating, but on the other hand, as you say, if it's so big and so dilated that it actually becomes the, a reservoir stomach, then potentially that's important. But we have seen that people who begin to trim the stomach may have more leaks. So when we see a bigger stomach pouch, this is not necessarily true, but this is my advice, add to the bypass, don't trim the stomach pouch. Thank you. If I may, if I may uh, Professor Fabi. Thank you, Robert, for, uh, for the presentation. You know, the acceptance of uh, mini gastric bypass when anastomosis gastric bypass till present is not yet to the success of the procedure. I think it is partly due to some personal uh, conflicts and probably to some lack of evidence that just, just started like four or four, five years ago with uh, part of our expert panel. How do you think as a creator of the MGB or AGB, we can work more for the acceptance uh, of uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass. Well, I think as Dr. Phoebe has often said, the biggest problem with the MGB is me, uh, Dr. Rutledge. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. On the other hand, part of the success is me as well. Um, I think that one of the things that holds it back is that it's done in a variety of ways by different surgeons. And uh, we are seeing a plethora, I mean, a huge number of publications. So I think it will kind of take care of itself. When Dr. Dragstedt began arguing and fighting for the, um, the uh, truncal vagotomy, a variety of techniques were used and it went through a lot of processes and variations. I think this is somewhat natural. There are a lot of people who do not do the MGB the way I do it. And uh, we just had a question. In other words, should you, you know, narrow the pouch? And there are a lot of questions which I think are good. There's no 
certainty that my first MGB is the ideal one. Let us go ahead and try different things, but let us be careful when we publish that we say this is the MGB with these particular modifications. Because what we're seeing, for example, are honest surgeons who are having bad outcomes. I don't think they're bad surgeons, but they have elected to modify the MGB in a common sense way. Um, we might like to see the MGB be adopted more broadly, more quickly, but maybe it's natural that we question Rutledge's first version. Maybe we should, for example, dissect the hiatus. I don't think you should. Maybe we should not do it in patients who have significant reflux. We do it routinely by the surgeons who follow my approach. So there are a lot of unanswered questions and the MGB is taking off so rapidly in so many places that I think that we should be somewhat satisfied. I don't necessarily think we have to push it. I think now we need like a wild horse, we need to be careful it doesn't run away and actually end up hurting patients. So we have lots to do. Uh, like for example, the recent Australia paper, they said 10% of their MGBs are reoperated on for conversion to ruin Y. Well, that's a judgment against MGB. So the question is, is that an inherent flaw of the MGB or is there a technical issue where we can guide our surgeons around the world and learn and say, we should change our approach. I have some ideas on that, <clears throat> but sometimes I should just be quiet and we have to let the process work out. Your a question is good, I'm behind you 100%. But I think now all of us are learning. And when we look, if we can ask the surgeons, particularly like the Y Omega trial had terrible outcomes. And they basically quoted their procedure as a one paragraph example in my first paper. That's not enough for us to judge the MGB. We don't know what they did in particular. So my bias is your questions are good. I would say we are riding a, a wild horse now. The MGB is taking off. Even in America, there are squeaks that they might start offering it. So I think it's happening. Now our goal is let's make it clear what di different components make it a good operation because we know certain modifications can make it bad. Thank you. Professor Carrigan. Yeah. <clears throat> so Dr. Rutledge, thanks very much for your talk. I think, I think we all acknowledge it's really difficult to be a prophet in your own land. Uh, and, uh, I think that's very true. And I think you're very modest in what you said before about uh, how you are accepting that maybe the way you started isn't the way it's going to be going forward. Because I think we all know you come up with a good idea, and I'm a fan of OAGB, uh, and I think you can come up with a good idea, but somebody else is going to run with that, and they're going to change it, and they're going to get more data, and we're all going to learn from that. And I think the fact you're willing to actually maybe compromise on that original design is actually quite encouraging in some way. I'm gonna bring you back to that because what I wanna talk about with you is limb length. Because a lot of the criticism of, of OAGB mini bypass has been around malabsorptive complications with excessive limb lengths. Uh, there's a current vogue for saying it's based on BMI. So BMI less than 50, 150 centimeters, more than 50, 200, simple, easy to remember, seems to work. But you're still, I noticed in your diagram you were showing before, talking about two to 300 centimeter BP limbs. So come on, tell us all about your latest thoughts about BP length, BP limb length. Um, I, I, I would really wish to give you the details, but I will just say a few words. S-I-B-O, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I think the diagnosis and the concerns about BP limb length are misplaced. Because look at this, why is it some people with a quote short common channel have trouble in eight months and why some other people are having it in my experience even 10 or 15 years later? Why is it many people with longer operations, many surgeons with longer operations bypassing more see it infrequently? And then I'll remind you of one more thing from our general surgery past, blind loop syndrome. In other words, what if it's not the BP limb, it's a bacterial overgrowth complication that it can occur in any one of the bypass patients. So I don't have enough time to go into it. I would love to contact you directly and get your advice. Over the past year, I have new research on 13 patients who pre presented with early symptoms. I don't think long bypass is the problem. I think it is a dietary event such that you have a 
uh, episode of food poisoning, which leads to the overgrowth of either Klebsiella or E. coli. And this is treatable. It is, uh, allows us then to consider again the longer bypass. And I have lots of data of my own and Dr. Uh, Coulars that show BP limb length is directly related to weight loss. And I'll also tell you one more thing is my five or six papers on this have all been rejected by the national or international journals. So if you want to be a, a co-author and help me get them published, probably put your name on, take my name off, we'd be set. But I can't go into more detail now without kind of interrupting our talk. Please contact me anytime. I'll go into all the detail on the latest research I have. This is brand new stuff just in the past year. Great. Okay. Thanks for that answer, Dr. Rutledge. I'll pass you back over to Mal because I think we're moving on to the next speaker now, but that's a great talk. Yes, Thank sir. you. Yes, sir. Dr. Wong, I think you take over from here. Uh, okay. Thank you. And so it's my great honor to, uh, to introduce our next speaker, Professor Chetan Palmer from the United Kingdom. He's a good friend of mine. He's also he's a consultant surgeon and head of Department of Surgery, honorary associate professor in the University College London. He's also the editor of Surgery, IBC Newsletter, and the International Journal of Surgery. He's also the Patient Safety Committee uh, of the BOMS. And Chetan is going to give us a talk uh, on the topic we found in the MGB to minimize and learn from the complications. Chitan, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hope you're having a good day, night, wherever part of the globe you are in. Uh, thank you, Harris. Thank you, IBC. And thank you, the IBC team, for this kind invitation. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction as well. And my topic today is refining the MGB to minimize complications and learn from all the complications we have already had. No disclosures. Now, why are we having this? talk in the first place of MGB. And as uh, I think Prof. Phoebe in the introduction rightly uh, mentioned, it's one of the top three performed bariatric uh, operations in the world now. And the uh, number is increasing and it is up to 6.6 .6 percentage. And as you can see, there are only two graphs which are going up. And it's, and it's uh, prevalent except North America in all the other IFSO chapters. And when we talk of MGB, we always have realized that there's always a debate, there's always a concern. And as uh, Harris has rightly decided to name this webinar topic, it's always under the microscope. Because whenever we talk of MGB, the common concerns which always we discuss are reflux, marginal ulcers, malnutrition, anemia, and uh, cancer. So let's try and see how we can uh, refine the MGB to avoid this and the complications which we have had and how to not have them in future. This systematic review nicely sums that up as well, where they have looked at all the mini gastric bypass which needed revisional operations. And they found that the three most common indications for revisions were severe malnutrition, chronic bile reflux, and intractable marginal ulcerations. So in today's talk, we'll quickly uh, try to address this by looking at the pre-op phase where we patient selection can help, intraoperative and postoperative. Now, remember, there are lots of experts out there that this talk is not for those experts. This is for people, new surgeons who are going to, you know, get MGB into their armamentarium. So this is for that. And it's, this is, it's not that this is the ideal way. This is some suggestions based on what we have learned over the last couple of decades. Let's talk of preoperative phase. We all agree prevention is better than cure. So I think the right patient selection is the key to avoid the complication. Let's talk of the big elephant in the room, cancer. I think that that's one of the biggest concerns we have. There are a couple of case reports. So let's look at this first case, which was reported in after an MGB. Asian male obese 54-year-old smoker who developed a cancer two years after the MGB. Now, I think 18 months to two years is a bit too early to develop. So what was the learning lesson from this complication? 
I think it was simple. This patient just needed a preoperative endoscopy in a male smoker, 54 year old Asian. I think that is probably the key we missed here. Let's look at the second case report of uh, cancer. Again, 52 year old male, high BMI. He actually had a history of reflux, had a four centimeter hiatus hernia, had an endoscopy which showed great C esophagitis. There is no mention of whether he was a smoker, what was the H. pylori status. And voila, again in 18 months to two months, he had a 2.5 centimeter, so good size uh, cancer with identical to Barrett's. So what was the learning lesson here? I think probably this, this lesion probably was missed on the pre-op endoscopy and they should have biopsied it extensively if they wanted to do bariatric surgery. And that would have shown up Barrett's to begin with. This nicely, um, takes us to the if supposition statement, which was published last year or so ago, which rightly say that all patients with upper GI symptoms should have pre-op OGD. They also go on to say that even without upper GI symptoms, we should have OGD because 25% of the chance they would have unexpected findings. In a real world, that is probably not possible, but I think to begin with, if we do OGD on all symptomatic patients, a, a pragmatic solution would be a option. Again, for pre-op patient selection, along with OGD, if you look at this survey of uh, all the bariatric surgeons in the world, majority agreed that caution should be offered to offer MGB in patients with Barrett's, symptomatic large hiatus hernias, active smokers, patient with severe active IBD, which might again, when you have the small bowel malnutrition and those issues, and cirrhotic of livers, again, maybe child pigs C or maybe even B. And again, as I say, this is, not really for the experts, but for people who are just beginning to uh, start doing MGB. So I think in the first 100, 200, they should avoid this cohort of patients. So I think this, if you look at these things, probably you would have avoided, you know, reflux, marginal ulcers, or malnutrition to begin with if you choose the right patients. Now, let's go to intraoperative uh, phase now. I think we all agree. And I think we already started the discussion that intraoperative, you know, long gastric pouch, preventing twist, hiatus hernias, limb lens <coughs> are going to be the key factors. So how can we, you know, refine the MGB to avoid those com complications of reflux ulcers and stuff? Let's look at this. Gastric pouch. I think we all know that we need to have the longest gastric pouch possible. And again, I think we all know that when we started a couple of decades ago, I think when we remember 10 years ago when we started, we were told to go at the crow's foot and start the pouch. And slowly over time, we have been told now go distal to the crow's foot, more towards the antrum on the horizontal part, which gives us more length of the small bowel. Again, I think the key for uh, young learners would be avoid dissecting five to seven centimeter of this, uh, you know, the lesser segmentary here the lesser momentum isn't it? because that will only lead to devascularization of the pouch, maybe contributing to marginal ulceration on even twisting of the lower pouch, which can contribute to reflux and also a bit of component of a, you know, picture of internal hernia. Again, I think the first firing becomes important. Uh, when you go below the crow feet, have an angulation down towards the left iliac fossa, to give you more length, and it can be seen more in this picture. As Rue and Y surgeons, I think we are trained to go in and fire straight, whereas in MGB, you have to go below the profus and also angulate down. You can see you can gain around four to five centimeter of excess length of your small uh, pouch there. And the length of the pouch is important, again, from all the complications. If you look at, uh, at this excellent paper of Mario, from multi-center survey of nearly 3,000 patients, they rightly found out that any pouch less than nine centimeter was directly related to patient having post-operative uh, reflux. So I think long gastric pouch, this would be a couple of key steps to gain that extra length. Again, sounds like a simple point, but when you use a 60 gun and you're trying to go and get that extra length, you tend to go near the greater curve. So please keep at least two centimeter distance between the stapler and the greater curve. It sounds stupid, but hey, -ho, we have actually done this as well and published this as well. So yeah, please be careful. Try to keep that uh, mainly if you're not using a 45 gun and you are using a 60 gun. 
Another key point, I think when we talk of Cobra head or a tie shaped pouch and trying to keep that uh, horizon, you know, the pouch in the horizontal plane, three o'clock, nine o'clock plane is important. And I think the key there is to try and keep the anterior posterior stomach walls equal. Because if you can see in the bottom right, if you don't have it equal and if you have more gain of the anterior pouch, this is what you have. Your pouch twists, contributing to reflux. And later on, it can also give rise, I think, to what people then label as internal hernia because your efferent limb will come towards the right of the patient. This is what an ideal pouch should look like. And there was an, if so, consensus conference where nearly 53 world experts were invited and they agreed that that's how a gastric pouch should look like, which should be calibrated on a 36 to <coughs> 38 French bougie, uh, as Professor Rutledge mentioned as well, that we should be avoiding unnecessarily hiatal dissections and, and stay at least 1.5 centimeter away from the angle of his to avoid a leak in that area. This is how the afferent and efferent limb should be lying when you are doing that anastomosis, no twists, no turns. That's about pouch. Now let's talk about the GJ anastomosis. I think. Um, we all agree that too small a GJ would predispose to reflux, acid and even bile, uh, leading to dysphagia and reflux in post-op scenario. Too long, personally, I feel that that just compromises on the gastric length. Imagine if you have a 12 centimeter pouch and you're doing a six centimeter anastomosis, you just compromise on that uh, length. Again, the experts invited by the IFSO agreed that the ideal width of the gastro and prostomy should be around three to five centimeters. And this is another important point to avoid marginal ulcer or reflux. If you look, I think the point of entry should be uh, your GJ anastomosis should be in the middle. Again, I think this implies in your Rue and Ys as well, because if you tend to go towards your right staple line here, you then have a tram line effect causing a bit of an ischemic segment there which can predispose to marginal ulcer in the post-op phase. I think another point to avoid reflux, I already saw a question in the chat box somewhere mentioning, asking a difference between NGB and OAGB. I think the OAGB surgeons tend to do an anti-reflux stitch where they stitch the afferent limb eight to 10 centimeters on the gastric pouch trying to avoid, and the argument there is it avoids reflux in a post-op scenario. They also tend to measure the whole small bowel length, but I'll not touch that. We're only talking of reflux and ulcers at the moment. Personally, I think most of the surgeons do more of what we call as a hybrid. They just stitch one or two uh, afferent limb stitches on it rather than a religious eight to 10 centimeter segment. Talking of limb length, I think we, there was already a question uh, by Kerrigan to, um, to Dr. Rutledge, and that this is an ongoing debate whether we should have a standard for all, whether it should be tailored to BMI, or whether we should be even measuring the whole small bowel length for all the patients. Let's look at briefly what we have there. I think we all know about the Omega trial and, and the way it made people stop doing MGB in France also because it showed that when you have a standard 200 centimeter BP limb for all patients, you have severe uh, nearly 20% plus nutritional adverse events. We also looked at around 1,000 of our patients from the UK. It was a multi-center study where we looked and we found that nearly 2.3% of our patients needed revision after MGB. And then we looked at in detail and we found that the cause, most common cause is either excess weight loss, diarrhea, malnutrition, deranged LFTs. This was in the early period, I'm saying in the first half of the last decade. And again, if you look at the right side, the majority of the patients had BP limb of around 200 plus, 300, 350, 250. So I think the key learning from those complications there was try and stick to 150 to 200 centimeter limb length, at least to begin with, uh, guys. You know, once you are expert and you're doing with religious compliance and good follow-up, then you can uh, be more brave. But I think to begin with, play safe. Talking of limb length again, I think if you look at our systematic review, when we looked at patients with BMI more than 50, you know, patient who had MGB as well, we found that the BP limb median was around 250 centimeters. So it was not that it was 300 or 350. When we looked at BMI less than 35 patients, 
Even in there, we found that BMI, uh, B prelim of 120 sufficed and gave excellent weight loss. When we looked at around 13,000 patients of uh, MGB, again, median BP limb was around 200 centimeter with up to 80% excess weight loss. Even as a revisional scenario, you know, when in failed bends and failed bypass, there was a tendency, sorry, failed sleeves, there is a tendency towards increasing the limb length. But when you look at this systematic review, we found that even in those, a BP limb of 200 centimeter was sufficient to give uh, excellent results in the post-op scenario. There's a lot of debate now that even 150 centimeters should be sufficient. Again, I think there are short-term results available at the moment, and there is a concern that there might be weight regain. There is only one paper just published uh, from a French group which looked at even at 150 centimeter at eight years, the weight loss was excellent at around 84.8%. So I think let's wait for more results, uh, publications, which will throw us more light on this uh, interesting topic. Again, that same group went on to look at 150 centimeter in BMI more than 50 and found that even in that cohort, they were happy that at five years, uh, the weight loss was 78% and only two patients needed further bariatric surgery to, for you know, insufficient weight loss. So I think it's getting more interesting with the BP limb. Um, so I think at least from what we have learned from all the publications at the moment with all the controversies with malnutrition and anemia is that probably stick to 150, 200 centimeter to be safe. Uh, again, that if so, consensus conference expert agreed that when you have, we are going to plan more than 200 centimeter, 91% agreed that we should be measuring the small bowel uh, length if you want to go more than that. Internal hernia, uh, I, I know it's an Achilles heel for Roux and Y gastric bypass. Majority of the mini gastric bypass surgeons don't tend to close the Peterson defect. Having said that, there have now been few case reports and a couple of case series of two, three cases as well uh, with this. And as I mentioned, I think it has to do also with the rotation of the pouch. And so, but I think uh, if you don't close it, have a low threshold for keeping an eye on it. The good thing is none of these series have reported that it need, ended up having ischemic bowel. So that's something good. But if any patient with persistent reflux, chronic abdo pain, unexplainable, have a low threshold for laparoscopy in that scenario because that rotation can actually manifest as reflux as well. So that was all intraoperative. Um, let's talk of the postoperative scenarios. I think, yes, if we have the right patient selection, you know, and if you do the right technical steps as well, we will be able to avoid reflux and marginal ulcer, but having said that, complications do happen. I think we will end up having some patients who will still have marginal ulcer, and, and uh, to, I think, prevent it in the first place, one survey of the surgeons and also from the consensus conference and the Delphi consensus, all of that evidence suggested that three to six months prophylactic PPI would be good to prevent marginal ulcers uh, afterward. And if it occurs, majority of the patients will respond very well to conservative management, double the dose of PPI, add sucralfate to it, do an endoscopy and a repeat endoscopy in three months, stop smoking, avoid NSAIDs. And I think we all agree that if at six months it still persists, probably a conversion to a RUNY might be a safer option. I don't want to dwell much into this, uh, but I think we all know that if you are Compliance with supplements is a must for avoiding any malnutrition and trace element issues afterward. I think this doses is suffice if we are less than 200 centimeter limb length. However, if it is more than that, probably we should double the dose of the multivitamins and iron if you are going more than two centimeter, uh, 200 centimeter, because then you are going to act more like a BPD uh, kind of picture. Uh, Again, more of a medical terminology, but I think for some patients who are non-compliant with their supplements, do keep a lookout for all these symptoms. And if they manifest with them, please re-supplement your trace elements, ions, and vitamin D. And that would have a nice patient journey in the end. I think for surgeons who want to start doing MGBs, please visit some expert, watch some videos, Luckily, we have contributed to some nice chapters in this few books which are available by IFSO, Springer, 
and another book which tells you about a safe MGB, do read that before uh, starting MGB. Yes, as Prof. Weiner mentioned earlier, it's an easy operation, but that doesn't mean we just start doing that without uh, having an idea of what actually are the key steps for that. Thank you very much, and I'm ready for the questions. Hope this is helpful. Thank you, Chitan, for such a great talk and give us uh, many uh, technical tips. So uh, before we go into the panelists, uh, may I start with a question first, if you don't mind? And in many countries, uh, MGB, uh, mini gauge bypass, is not as popular uh, as uh, wound wire gauge bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. So in your experience, or do you have any recommendation uh, for them to convince the surgeon or convince the patient to accept the surgery, I mean, the MGB? I think you're trying to say that in North America, it's not as popular as the rest of the world, really. Um, so uh, we all know the history of MGB and how things are going. I think the key would be, I think there are a few surgeons now who are doing MGB and, and we have had Scott Shikora, you know, the president and few American surgeons behind uh, before as well. They have started doing some MGB as a revisional uh, scenario. Uh, I think the key would be to publish, publish, publish all honest data out there. And I think once they look at all the data and long-term results, you know, we have had lots of one-year, two-year follow-up data. I think we now need more 10-year, 20-year follow-up data. And I think they would, they would have no choice but to start it because the, the key force is the fact patients. I think once the patients read about it, they will start demanding the operation and that will help then the surgeons fight the case. I'm told there's a lot of issue with insurance and things as well, but I think patient would be the key factor. When they read good things about the operation, they will ask their surgeons, why can't I have that operation? I think that that should be the key. Okay, thank you, Chetan. And any feedback from the panelists? Yes, if I may. Thank you, Chetan. Uh, you know, we are celebrating now the like the 55th anniversary of the Rouen Wagastic Bypass. And till present, we don't have a clear BP limb that we will adopt. And it is because of Yushetan, the work of Kamal, John Mark, and a lot of scientists that we started to adopt the 150, 180 centimeters for uh, meningastic bypass. But our problem now, and as David mentioned, we have a real um, a clear failure and when doing 150 or 180 for weight regain after a steel gastrectomy. So what is your approach for these patients specifically in terms of the sleeve, what you are going to do to the sleeve and the BP limb length? Uh, that's an interesting question. I and mean, as you know, I think um, we just need more and more evidence for this thing. And I think uh, we need honest data out there. For sleeves, I think, uh, as you uh, probably I just briefly touched on our systematic review, looking at there are about five to 600 sleeves conversion to MGB, which are published. And in those, there were excellent results after it. And I think to for experts, it is fine. But I think learners, any uh, sleeve with only weight failure or poor weight loss, I think a conversion to MGB or OGB is good. But I think if it comes to severe reflux is the indication for, for conversion, then probably I would say probably stick with Ru and Y. That's a safer option compared to MGB. Uh, compare, uh, looking at the BP limb, I think that was another part of your question. Uh, again, the systematic review looked that, yes, there was a range from 150 to around 300 centimeter BP limb length in cases of band to MGB and sleeve to MGB conversion. But when you look at the majority of the paper, the median uh, limb length was still 200 centimeter and it gave up to 70 to 80% further excess weight loss. So I think even in those scenarios, sticking at 200 centimeter should do the trick. Thank you. Uh, Chetan, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Yeah. Uh, both you and Robert, uh, Robert has presented a good historical perspective. And you've given us uh, guidelines on doing the procedure. And from the two talks, the questions that came up was, why is this not accepted? The main problem is simple. 
we should stop defending the procedure. We have like 30% revision rate with the sleeve. We have reflux with the sleeve. I don't see anybody defending it. With the gastric bypass, we have anemia. We have internal hernias. You don't have anybody fighting and defending it. <laughs> and I think we cause more problem trying to defend it because the MGB is just another good surgical procedure that should belong in our mammentarium. It should not be an operation for everybody, just like the gastric bypass is not an operation for everybody. And it should not be an operation for everybody just like the sleeve. But when somebody publishes and reports that complication of the MGB, we should accept the publication and then have the academicians do a review. I think one of the problems is that most of the people doing the MGB have acted like a club and therefore they find themselves caged. It's an excellent procedure, I'll tell you, having done quite a few. And I think uh, we'll move on to the next session, but we should stop defending the procedure. Just do it. Agree. Oh. Agree. I think every, comp every operation has its pros and cons. And I think we accept the pros and we accept the cons. Definitely. And refine it to make it better. And with those uh, very wise words, Mal, uh, uh, which I totally agree with as well, uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Now, this is an interesting one. It's Helmut Billy from the USA. Uh, now, Helmut's the president of the Californian section of the ASMBS, and he's a bariatric surgeon in Ventura, which is kind of halfway between Santa Barbara and, and, and L.A. Uh, what you may not know about Helmut, a couple of things here. One is his undergraduate degree was actually in molecular biology, but he obviously realized life was going to be a lot more fun being a bariatric surgeon, so much so that he isn't actually quite here yet. He's still in the OR. Uh, and it did actually take Dr. Viner and I quite a little bit of you know cash to one side to Helmut to get him to do that because of course England Germany starts in about two minutes time uh, but and the best laid plans and all that money that Rudy paid Helmut has not worked because Professor Ariel has unfortunately agreed to step in and give the talk for him so with no further ado I'll hand over to Ariel who will present Helmut's talk and I'll just have to put the skybox on record. Well thank you for this invitation to I have the opportunity to discuss how we're going to ensure the high standards of mini gastric bypass surgery performed globally in the years to come, especially since if so has now recognized this procedure as a acceptable bariatric operation. Where do we go from here? These are my disclosures. And there's really a never ending controversy around mini gastric bypass, especially as it's taken a long time for if so and the ASMBS to recognize the procedure. The ASMBS is still considering mini gastric bypass and has not yet endorsed it. But in 2018, if so did, releasing this position statement. Uh, this was a statement that had two former ASMBS presidents as co authors, among many other esteemed international faculty. And really, there were two statements that came out of this review that was done by IFSO. Uh, one, IFSO commissioned a task force to determine if the mini gastric bypass or OAGB really was an effective and safe procedure and should it be considered as a surgical option for the treatment of obesity and metabolic disease. And the final conclusion was that OAGB was a recognized bariatric metabolic procedure and should not be considered investigational. And there were other recommendations and comments and observations made uh, during the review that are important to remember. Some people would say that the mini gastric bypass is now one of the most overstudied bariatric operations and therefore by default should be recommended and considered despite what the literature uh, may have as far as gaps and or concerns. So let's look at the if so position statement, which was done in 2018. Uh, this statement identified 3,000 plus records and reviewed 255 eligible studies. And in the end, 87 full length publications were identified uh, for inclusion. And these had 78 papers focused on outcomes. 52 studies had very good follow up, greater than a year, and good study numbers, more than 15 patients per study. Uh, 26 studies had less than one year follow up. Nine studies focused on complications. 
of the 52 studies that were included with good follow-up and good study numbers, that encompassed 16,500 patients with a mean average of 94 patients per study. This included four randomized controlled trials with 191 patients, and the overall complication rate uh, was 8.9% for an early complication rate. And this was primarily anastomotic leaks, wound infections, bleeding, and an anastomotic uh, stricture or organ perforation. And the late complications which were identified in the position statement was marginal ulcer, bowel obstruction, malnutrition, and reflux. And these are some of the four most important areas for us to follow up and maintain if we're going to maintain high standards and keep these as low as possible. And the first area of importance is operative technique. What did they find out? Is standardization really a possibility? Well, we found that the technique varies between groups performing OAGB and MGB. And for an operation that should be quite easy and straightforward to standardize, we still have disagreement. The pouch size in these studies and the bougie size varies. Most commonly, the pouch was uh, dis discussed as a dissection at or just below the crow's foot with two to five centimeters below the coast root being discussed. And the bougie size varies from 36 French to 42 French. The gastrogygenostomy, the creation of it is also another area of concern. The linear stapler being the most common and the length varies from 30 millimeters to 60 millimeters with partial stapler lengths being used by many of the authors to create an anastomosis from one and a half to two and a half centimeters. Surprisingly, hand-sewn anastomoses are not commonly used in these operations. And finally, the third area of operative technique being limb lengths. <clears throat> this is the area of most uh, common diversity <clears throat> or lack of consensus. 200 centimeters being the most commonly discussed, reported by 27 studies, and nine studies had repeated limb lengths of less than 200 centimeters, with five studies having limb lengths of greater than 200 centimeters. So how do we understand the published outcomes that were reviewed by IFSA? Well, <clears throat> the conclusion with weight loss was that it's effective and durable to five years. And there was a favorable effect on type 2 diabetes mellitus, but the numbers reported are small, and the durability of the glycemic effect is really not reported or followed up. So this is an area that needs more uh, attention. Uh, it seems to be that many, many studies show a favorable effect, but it's not nearly as well studied as duodenal switch or RUI gastric bypass. And bile reflex, well, the rates of symptomatic bile reflex are lower than expected and often depends on too much self-reporting and there's a lack of EGD data or endoscopic evaluation of the distal esophagus in asymptomatic patients. And nutritional outcomes, these need to be expanded and going, ongoing follow-up and care needs to be reported because this is the area of most concern because authors simply do not report long-term data on nutritional outcomes that's convincing, established, or sustained. So we have four areas to focus on to establish good outcomes and ensured uh, uh, results that maintain high standards, weight loss, type 2 diabetes mellitus treatment and resolution, bile reflux, and the consequences of it, and nutritional outcomes. We understand the literature and we look at what may be the ideal operative techniques. They have not yet been identified. The most common description, again, is dissecting below the crow's foot or, or just below it, stapling the anastomosis with a 200 centimeter fixed common limb. But tremendous variation still exists. And at the end of the if so recommendations, type 2 diabetes mellitus is promising, but there's a lack of long term evidence to support durability. Bile reflux is perhaps underreported and or is not a major issue because most of the evaluation uh, with respect to bile reflux was self-reported by the patients and really long-term care evaluation by physicians with endoscopy really is needed to further assess it. And national and international registries are really encouraged. This may be the best way to sustain high standards with physicians who are performing significant numbers to report their numbers and their long-term care uh, in these types of registries. And finally, if so, recommended that OAGB be recognized and that the name OAGB-MGB be the uh, preferred name 
and it should no longer be considered an investigational bariatric or metabolic procedure. So how to ensure these high standards? Well, first we have to establish a standardized operation and these illustrations exhibit the Rutledge technique on the left and the Carballo or Spanish technique on the right. My technique is, is pretty much the same as the Spanish. Is this the technique we should use? We identify the crow's foot and then we uh, go ahead and start doing our dissection there with a proposed line of transection over 40 French bougie extending towards but wide of the angle of hiss. This is how I create my pouch. Is this the way it should be created? Identification of the crow's foot staying proximal to the pylorus and beginning my dissection one to two to three centimeters below. We do a stapling across that point, and then we do a linear staple extending towards the angle of hiss, maintaining the location of the crow's foot. And then I do a gastrojejunostomy with the posterior row and the intended site of the anastomosis being above the staple line. There's lack of consensus. Maybe we should be doing this below the staple line. Uh, and the afferent and efferent limbs are well established, and the gastric pouch is identified and uh, maintained in a continuous uh, reproducible uh, manner, period. I, uh, I use a uh, three to four and a half centimeter stapled gastrogygenostomy. I don't do the entire staple length and I close with a running 3 ovipral suture over the bougie, which is 40 French, and it is uh, manipulated into the efferent limb. Finally, I close the mesenteric defect on every single patient. Uh, to decrease the chance of internal hernia and the end up uh, the end result of the gastrogygenostomy is that it's right at or near the colon or slightly below it. One year later the procedure looks very similar to the Rutledge technique even though we did a side-by-side -side Spanish technique. So how do we standardize a procedure that takes an incredible amount of work and consensus and agreement in order to produce those kinds of standards. And we need to continue with further standardization uh, consensus conferences to try to emerge what our procedure should be. What about follow-up? What about bile reflux? It's been uh, suggested that it's self-reported and routine endoscopy might be better. Uh, how are we gonna address bile reflux? Are we gonna do a conversion to a roux or a brawn enterostomy? How are we going to ensure standards uh, that require a consensus on operative technique identification of long-term complications, reflux complications, nutritional, and how are we gonna manage, manage these complications? This all needs to be addressed and agreed upon by consensus, and it has not yet reached that level. Take bile reflux, for example. Many people say it's simply not a problem, but this is more anecdotal. Here's one of my patients that we routinely end, uh, endoscope specifically, and particularly if they have symptoms. And here you can see bile reflux is indeed occurring. All too often we have arguments over, did you do the right technique? Oh, you did it wrong. The first question when we're addressing this is a question as to someone's technique. Again, showing that we need to have some standardization, but I think the treatment needs to be the more important uh, discussion with respect to these kinds of complications. Here is the same patient, and you can see there's inflammation at the gastrojejunostomy. As we go further down, we've decided that our treatment will be a brawn enterostomy, stay away from that inflamed area. And then how we do the brawn enterostomy becomes a significant uh, topic of discussion. And these areas are, are not really prone to uh, consensus yet. In my situation, I approximate the anti-mesenteric border, uh, 30 to 40 centimeters proximal and distal along the afferent and efferent limbs. We create an enterostomy and then widen those openings, followed by a stapled brawn enteroenterostomy in a side-by-side -side fashion, and then the, uh, and then the uh, anastomosis is completed. So what about malnutrition? This is also an area that needs to be standardized and maintained if you're going to have long-term uh, results that are sustained internationally. And so you must have a complication rate that's lower than other procedures, or at least the same, and the risk of malnutrition must be easy to reverse or modify. But what does the data say? Well, probably the only real study of any significant papers was done by Ganser, and he had almost 3,000 patients, and 26 were identified with severe malnutrition, and he treated them all by reversal. 
of MGB to normal anatomy and all responded to that. So malnutrition has to be addressed as to how to do this. And tracking of data, outcomes, and complications are going to be the way that high standards are ensured. National registries and international registries are essential for this. Marginal ulcers after a mini bypass are often discussed as being not really a problem. Well, we need to prove this. Here's a marginal ulcer that I've seen in one of my patients. Uh, so my, my own series is one that has seen many of the complications that are described or, or concerned about. However, in the long run, the only complication I have not yet seen is related to mal malnutrition after a mini bypass with a standard 200 centimeter fixed panel. So limb lengths, this is the latest area of topic in both bypass and, and mini bypass surgery. Limb lengths and total bowel lengths, how to measure them becomes a significant area of discussion. Should we be doing fixed 200 centimeter lengths or should we be doing tailored biliopancreatic limb lengths uh, with respect to a 40% uh, biliopancreatic limb as compared to the total limb length? These uh, have been published and these are papers from 2019. And this is an area of ongoing discussion and consideration. Perhaps standardization of limb lengths will become important. And the conclusions in these studies were tailored limb lengths for the biliopancreatic limb in an MGB. Uh, if it's 40% of the total bowel length is safe, effective, and possibly even a better nutritional event than just using a 200 centimeter limb. This all has yet to be uh, standardized. Identifying areas of non-consensus. Well, the if so did a consensus panel report in 2000, it were 52 experts from 28 countries and they voted on 90 uh, consensus statements. And it's really interesting to look at the area we have no consensus. And this is a rather long list. OAGB is an appropriate procedure for adolescents, no consensus. An appropriate procedure for youth, 15 to 24, no consensus. It's an appropriate bariatric procedure for patients with GERD, no consensus. OAGB is appropriate for patients with a type 2 hiatal hernia, no consensus. Contraindicated patients with liver cirrhosis, minimal limb length, limb length should be no consensus. Total bowel length should always be measured, no consensus. Total bowel length should be measured Whenever possible, no consensus. Esophagitis is a contraindication, no consensus. The best way to choose limb length of BP limb should be based on. When measurement of the total small bowel length is performed, the ideal percentage limb length for bili biliopancreatic limb should be. To avoid gastric pouch rotation, it should be done as an anastomosis on the posterior wall, but not on the anterior wall, no consensus. What is the preferred place for the pouch, anterior, posterior, no consensus. And among symptomatic patients with normal preoperative endoscopy, when should the first endoscopic surveillance be done after surgery? No consensus. And on and on and on. But there were significant areas of consensus. And I'm not going to go over every single line, but just suffice to say that surgeons and multidisciplinary teams should receive special training. And we should just not start doing this based on a YouTube video. A BP limb length of 200 centimeters was the safe and effective and possibly safest. Uh, limb length that we are aware of. Severe complications are best handled at high volume centers and patients require long-term vitamin and nutritional supplementation and more importantly, lifelong monitoring. So establishing a standardized operative technique is essential if we're going to maintain high standards nationally and internationally. Data registries are going to be essential to assist us in understanding the progression and the results that are obtained with MGB as we currently do with other procedures for bariatric surgery. This is essential for nutritional outcomes, monitoring marginal ulcerations, reflux, and specifically bile reflux, and also the technical complications that the practices are experiencing with respect to leaks, strictures, and optimal anastomosis outcomes. Total limb length versus fixed limb length has to be agreed upon and is an undergoing area of research and this will uh, be something that has to be elucidated in the future. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present these topics, and, uh, and I hope it was uh, helpful to open discussion as to the future of MGB. Thank you. Fantastic, great lecture, and I'm glad he's not present, so we can move on to the next session. Oh, I, I popped in now. Panel. Are you here? I, oh, I popped in, so. You popped in. I thought you were watching the ball game. Okay. No. I'll take it back. Uh, 
I don't have any questions for you. Oriel, do you have any questions? Or, I mean, Dr. Fowl? Fowl? Uh, yes, I have a question, Helmut. Um, for uh, a revisional uh, reversal of one anastomosis gastric bypass, um, I reversed uh, two months ago a patient with severe steatorrhea with uh, bad foul smelling uh, gas and stool. So any uh, recommendations in this regard? Well, the, the reversal is, in a, if you've done a primary OAGB, the reversal is very straightforward. It, it's just one anastomosis to transect and then you can easily reestablish continuity. I think it's easier than doing Wu Y reversal, and and I think it's easier, uh, and I think you can determine quickly whether you're alleviated the symptoms with a simple reversal. I don't have any experience with trying to alleviate symptoms by converting to a Wu or changing the limb length. Thank you. Rudolph. Okay, Dr. We'll Rudolph, again. we can move on to the next session now. for introduction of the other panelists. Yes. Are you? Yes, definitely. Well, first of all, I want to say uh, that uh, out of our uh, almost 18,000 uh, members online, we have around half uh, watching uh, online right now. And I just want to call out that uh, we have viewers from South Africa, New Zealand, Barbados, uh, Nigeria, Guatemala, South Korea, Indonesia, and other parts of the world. So this is definitely a very, very popular um, topic. So I want to start by presenting uh, our 10 panelists, and I'm going to start off with Professor Rui Ribeiro from Portugal. He's a metabolic surgeon since 2001, past president of the Portuguese Bariatric Surgery Society, and member of IFSO EC Information and Development Committee, and also metabolic surgery director of Clisa Luciades, a private hospital in Lisbon, Portugal. I also want to present uh, Dr. Sonia Chapeta from Italy. She's head of obesity and metabolic surgery unit, Ospedale Evangelico Betania in Naples, Italy. Also, Ms. Jennifer Darian from the United Kingdom, consultant bariatric surgeon in Phoenix Health, Chester, United Kingdom. Dr. Mark, Mark Fouquet from Belgium. He is pioneer of the MGBOAGB in Belgium and founder and head of the Clinic for Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery Center for Mini Gastric Bypass at St. Elizabeth Hospital in Zotegam, Belgium. I also want to present Professor Imran Abbas from the United Aber Emirates. He's director of Dubai Obesity Clinic in Iranian Hospital, Dubai, and CEO and founder of the Global Laparoscopy and Robotics, GLR. And Professor Osama Taha from Egypt. He is chief medical officer of Overweight Surgery Clinics in Cairo, Egypt, and chief of bariatric surgery unit, Asuit University Hospital, Asuit Egypt, and professor of surgery, Asuit University, Asuit Egypt. And of course, uh, professor Mario Musella from Italy is Professor of Surgery at Federico II University Advanced Biomedical Sciences Department uh, in Naples, Italy, and past president of International MGB OAGB Club. And I will pass it on for Dr. Haisam Fawal, who will introduce the rest of our panelists. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Sergio, Sergio Verbunen who is a former president of the College of General Surgeons from Tijuana. Dr. Mohit Al-Bandari, he is the director of Mohawk Bariatrics and Robotics from Indoor, associate professor of surgery, and Professor Nasser Sakran, uh, who is a professor and head of the department of surgery at bar -Itan University. Okay, let me start with Ru Rui. I see the case was presented with a bar reflux and the treatment was a bronze anastomosis. I know you do something different. How would you handle that case? Hi, congratulations to all the speakers. And uh, I would say first that I completely agree with what Dr. Elmut Billy said about the technique. And just to rem uh, remark that uh, I would say that uh, MGB or OAGB is not, a, it's a simple concept, but not a simple operation, because if you want to perform it properly, uh, you need to take attention to so many uh, 
uh, tricks that it is it will not be easy in a very heavy patients or individual surgery. So we need to teach the technique and to need to standardize really uh, even the MGB or the OAGB technique uh, and to have some rules. I completely agree about the, the pouch length and the limb length. It's very important to agree, to have an agreement about those issues to get uh, standardized outcomes also. About the bioreflex, I suppose everything has been said before. The, with the experience, the, the rate is quite low, around 2%. If you don't, if you perform a long pouch and narrow, and with a good line between the pouch and the afferent limb, uh, trying to avoid the the, the um, afferent limb uh, syndrome because it will induce reflex in the future. Uh, if you do so, it's easy to resolve, and uh, we have solved it since the beginning with uh, much success with the uh, run wide diversion that we later called the diverted OAGB, even for primary cases in people with, with esophagitis or with previous reflux. And it was in 100% of the cases, it never failed. About the, 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 the general genostomy, I've tried it a couple of times and it failed in one of them. So I, didn't, I don't have any experience, but what I can say is that the run wide diversion works properly. And another issue for the, Malabsorption when it happens, and it can happen in, uh, also in some patients, one to percent in my in my experience in my uh, cases. Uh, we can solve it also, and to reduce the biliopancreatic limb, uh, uh, enlarging the, the common limb and the absorption power, it works good. We don't need uh, in the in the first time to go for reversion immediately. Please try, as Dr. Rutledge uh, advised in the beginning to reduce the biliopancreatic limb to a short limb, one meter, one to end, and it will solve the problem in most of the cases. Dr. Carrigan, <laughs> you have any questions for the next panelist? Yeah, I was going to ask uh, so Sonia, uh, there's been a lot of sort of OAGB, MGB talk going on today. So could you just explain to the audience, if you could, uh, what you understand to be the difference between a, a, a mini gastric bypass and an OAGB, or are they two different operations or are they the same thing? What do you think? So hello to everybody. Um, congratulations to all the speakers. I have to say regarding sleeve gastrectomy and room wide gastric bypass, in my opinion, it is the same procedure because we have one anastomosis, we have um, the malabsorption. So um, this is the advantage um, that we have comparing it to sleeve gastrectomy and to room wide gastric bypass. We have um, a better weight loss, we have um, less uh, internal hernia, we have less dumping syndrome. But um, when we talk about one anastomosis gastric bypass, mini gastric bypass regarding the surgical technique, um, I have to say they are two different surgeries. Um, I had the honor um, working with Rudolf Weiner that Robert Watlich uh, came to us um, in 2014 and um, we changed our technique and um, typically for the MGB is um, the anastomosis on the posterior gastric wall. And this is, in my opinion, but this is evidence, um, quite important. And um, to, to do not measure the um, whole small bowel, um, excluding 150, 180, 200 centimeters of biliopancreatic limb, is also an advantage of MGB. So we have in the ORGB um, another gastrogenostomy, uh, and we have um, the measurement of the whole small bubble in um, one anastomosis gastric by bypass. So um, in conclusion, the surgical technique is different and we have to see in the future if there is a difference in bioreflux, marginal or ulcers and um, malnutrition. But um, at the end, um, talking about um, a good or ideal perfect uh, bioreflux procedure um, in the future, 
I have to say that um, the advantages of the one anastomosis um, are reflected in both procedures. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May I ask Osama Taha a question? Yes, please. Osama, are you online? Osama? Professor Taha, you mean? Doesn't look like. Professor Taha, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Oh, okay. Osama, uh, my question to you is, uh, you have one of the largest series of revisional uh, surgery after restrictive procedure to an anastomosis. I mean, band to an anastomosis, a sleeve, and VBG to an anastomosis. Do you think that the approach should be different? And what is your uh, data till present? Actually, uh, we have a, uh, done a lot of uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass of uh, different restrictive procedures including VBGs, which has been done a lot in Egypt, uh, bands and sleeve gastrectomies. And what we have discovered that uh, one osmosis gastric bypass could be an acceptable option after sleeve gastrectomy, yet it's uh, not recommended after bands and VBGs. And, and the, main, the main issue here is not the one osmosis gastric bypass, the main issue here is the uh, uh, altered, altered propulsive movement that happens after placing the bands and the high pressures uh, procedures like the VBG that uh, alter the valve between the esophagus and uh, the cardia. Uh, and the patient will be much more uh, vulnerable and much more facing reflux and complaining of reflux, of biliary reflux when we do one as most gastric bypass after bands and after VBGs. Right now, we don't do one as most gastric bypass for patients after VBGs and bands. We do only own Y gastric bypass, yet it's an acceptable option after sleep gastrectomy. <coughs> Rudy, do you have any questions uh, you, you want to put to the panel? Dr. Weiner? I am, you mean, uh, sorry. Um, no, just uh, back, back to uh, the difference between MGB and OLGB. Uh, main concern was the beginning, original rat catch is MGB. And then uh, Ga uh, Garcia Gabriero was studying this uh, long tube with uh, stitches. And it takes a lot of time to make an anti reflux uh, procedure. This is the main difference. Uh, nothing regarding uh, limb length or, or other things. And uh, finally, uh, it's a wide, uh, wide uh, range what we are doing. Many doing anti reflux. We stopped after six years anti reflux procedure because we saw the end uh, no effect. Uh, so fi finally, uh, it's a good idea, uh, but finally, it doesn't work really to prevent any problems. So maybe uh, yeah, many of these uh, 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 surgeons are here performing uh, different types of either NGB or LGB, and uh, it's very difficult to do, uh, compare. Everybody should explain at the beginning: I'm doing originally MGB, or I'm doing originally OLGB, or I'm doing something else. This is different. Okay, great. In, in terms of bile reflux, which is obviously one of the things we've talked about as a worry about these operations, I noticed uh, you've got Jen Darian on the panel. And, and Jen, you published an obesity surgery recently looking at the effectiveness of the brawn technique for treating bile reflux. Have you got any comments you want to make about the kind of treatment algorithm, if you like, for, for bile reflux after uh, mini bypass OAGB? Hi, yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, we did publish a study recently in obesity surgery at Phoenix Health, and we reviewed our past four years' data of our OAGBs, looking at the incidence of bile reflux and how we managed it thereafter. So our incidence was sitting around about 2.6%, and we made the diagnosis based upon clinical and endoscopic findings taken together. So everybody's commenced on medical management. 
to high-dose PPI, metoclopramide and sucralfate in preference to gabascon. Our surgical strategy would be to perform a Braun procedure in the first instance. We've in fact performed 14 of those now in our past four years cohort, and we have an 85% complete success rate and resolution of symptoms of bile reflux. For the remaining two patients, there was a partial response and that it was a delayed return of symptoms, both of whom responded well to Y gastric bypass or conversion. So we do believe that medical management with a step up to Braun procedure and room eye gastric bypass is effective for the management of bile reflux. Great, thanks very much, Jen. Uh, Professor Sakran, you have very strong feelings about the OAGB. Can you help us how we can get the rest of the world to come on board? Hi. Yeah, yeah, I mean, thank you uh, again for the invitation. Uh, I hope uh, this year we can in Israel publish another papers about uh, our experience. We have now more than uh, uh, in Israel, it's about 70% of our operation now, it's OAGB or MGB. It's, uh, I can talk about that after that. Uh, I all the time they ask me what happened in Israel, why our surgeons convert or switch the, the type of the operation that before six years, the most common procedure was a sleeve gastrectomy. And now uh, uh, the sleeve gastrectomy in Israel is less than 20% and one anastomosis gastric bypass is a, a 70%. And I think it's for three reasons. The first, that we have, uh, we make, we and uh, we perform a lot of sleeves, and uh, we have uh, a lot of leak. And with because we know that the sleeve is uh, high system pressure, when some patients have leak, that is very tough to treat. Okay, stent and uh, another stent and a clip, another clip, and to convert and total gastrectomy and etc. etc. And this is one point. And we had about 9% of these leaks that are mortality. The next reason it's that we have now publication also in Israel that our patient after five years, we have about 50% that have started with weight regain. 50% is a lot, my friends. And the third, this is also very important that we have GERD, or de novo reflux, okay? We all the time, uh, the ruin my gastric bypass surgeons attack us about the bile reflux and nobody talk about the acid, okay? That it is also important that we know that acid reflux, they can, uh, uh, the, our patient that can have barrett and after barrett, they can have uh, 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 cancers there. And it is that the, the three reasons. And in Israel, you know, uh, not only Israel, in the, all the world, we know that the restrictive procedures today, it's not enough for our patients, okay? We, we, we tried banding, we tried sleeve, we tried BBG. The restrictive procedure, I think it's failed. And more and more surgeons convert to, to, a, to a, well, gastric bypasses. And when, if you ask me uh, why we prefer one anastomosis or MGB, I said before, it's really, it's easy and it's more malabsorptive than ruin my gastric bypasses. And the technique that we made, when, we, when you made a very long a, a pouch, this is for me perfect because, you know, our patients, they can suffer, they can have a, a, a huge liver sometimes. When you have very long, very long a pouch, no problem. You can have we can make the, the anastomosis without problem. No tension in this anastomosis. No leaks in this. We can, but it's really we don't see leaks in this anastomosis, and uh, uh, we have great results. Okay, I talk about business in Israel in three years, but I hope in this years also we can talk. About, uh, we can publish five years of our results about 5,000 cases, okay? This is a really huge number in, in, in little country. Maybe we can ask Mike 
Uh, yes. Mark, uh, what is about the situation in Belgium? Belgium was also a, a country which you are doing everything. All yes. Is there any 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 trend at the moment? What what is the situation in Belgium? Yeah. And, and yes. Yes. Already. Now, according to the last figures that we have, is that about, let's say, 40% of the operations are sleeves, about 50% are Rue and Y. Um, but the one of the most gastric bypass is absolutely not popular in Belgium. And the reason is that, well, a lot of, 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 of the um, academic people are very reluctant uh, towards the one anastomosis gastric bypass, especially for reflux, for cancer, etc. So it is very difficult um, to, to, to get the situation in Belgium as for instance in Israel or, in, or, or, or elsewhere. Um, because let's say it is accepted, but a lot of people who are doing OGB well, they, 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 they are, let's say, they will deny that they're doing RG, uh, MGB. That's the problem. That's yeah. the problem. Although we have very good results, um, we have performed over 2000 um, OAGBs with very good results. It's still, well, not fully accepted in Belgium. They're, they're still very reluctant. There is but, no but, let's, let's have a question. Do you have seen any, any cancer, case of cancer? Because the cancer of the bypass is mainly in the remnant stomach. Uh, Rune Y is the same. And uh, do you have seen any case, any, any cancer after uh, MGB in, in Belgium uh, since the last 10 years? Well, not that I'm aware of. We had one, one cancer after OAGB, but it was a spindle cell carcinoma, so it, it was a, a smoker and a drinker. It had nothing to do with the operation itself. No, but the problem is that, well, they, they, they have problems with the fact that, that it isn't well scientifically uh, uh, proven that it's a good operation, although it's accepted and endorsed by, by IFSO, but as long as it isn't endorsed by ASMBS, well, it looks like the Belgian Society of, of uh, obesity, surgery, ob obesity Surgery stays reluctant towards the, the OAGB. But nevertheless, well, you know, uh, 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 legendary surgeons as, as, as Dr. Dillemans, Dr. Hempes, et cetera, they are performing the, the OAGB. But well, if it comes to scientific meetings, they're still, well, they're still reluctant to watch it. Okay, so there are no, no cases after MGB. This case from uh, Shetan, this case from Germany, you show this uh, publication. Uh, remove it, please. It uh, wasn't our hospital. This was a mistake, yeah? Well, ah, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> may, may I ask Mohit uh, Bandari, Dr. Bandari, one question? Go ahead, please. Mohit, uh, you, uh, you were one of the first to um, uh, study the outcome of one anastomosis gastric bypass when we have different BP limb length. What is your actual recommendation and did it, did it, uh, did it differ if we have like metabolic syndrome or a super BMI in your practice? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that uh, question. Uh, I think so. Uh, uh, this particular concept of uh, limb lens is uh, different for different individuals because uh, different countries would have different kind of uh, dietary habits. Uh, also, different surgeons calculate the limb lens very differently. And the bowel length may vary under different conditions of anesthesia and relaxation of the abdomen. Uh, but just to simplify uh, an answer to your question, I would say we would say any limb length below 200 centimeters uh, calculated very uh, meticulously should not cause a short bubble syndrome uh, in any ethnicity. Uh, that's what we have realized. Uh, 
so at our center we have standardized our limb lengths to 180 cm uh i was very aggressive until uh, before professor phobi joined me in 2014 15 and 16 but later on we uh, thought that we saw our data and we were having more than 100% access weight loss in indian patients and we had to reverse 15 of our patients out of or uh, 2500 patients we performed uh, before 2018 so then we sat and we decided that okay we will first standardize the way we measure these bowel number 2 we not going to go above 180 cm uh, of limb length uh, so at this point of time um, no even on the super obese uh, i am not increasing my limb lengths uh we just do a standard of 180 cm uh but for all those cases before uh, 2017 uh, where we did 250 plus we had to revise 15 to 16 of uh, those patients due to a more than 100% access weight loss thank you uh let me go to mark you were talking about belgium do you yes that uh, because quite a few of the patients who come to belgium are not from belgium and the doctors are reluctant to do patients uh, do an mgb in patients they cannot follow up you think that's a good rationale well um, i must say uh, mel that i did a lot of um, patients coming from abroad let's say 10 15 years ago that was mainly gastric bands i didn't do a lot of of oagbs for patients coming from abroad and especially for the reason that you mentioned that you have a very poor follow up i don't know how is medical tourism at this moment in belgium but i'm sure that there are uh, for instance in bruges they do a lot of uh, ru and why for people yeah. coming from abroad so i don't know but especially for um the oagb i'm not keen to do this operation for patients coming from abroad and 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 well being afraid of indeed nutritional problems and 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 problems of reflux or or others that that we are not able to diagnose of course uh, mario you're on board do you have a lot of experience and you've published a bit quite a bit i don't have a specific question but After listening to these speakers, do you have any point you would like to make so we can take home? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mal. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Harris, for for involving me in this very interesting debate. Well, uh, well, I have a sort of emotional uh, bias because all all of you is we are good friends, and I agree basically with the vast majority of the things I've ever I've heard so far. In this slide, I, I believe the only only strength we have uh, are numbers, um, because conversely, I understand also the objections that Dr. Billy as 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 number has presented to us. So in this slide, if I can, I, I would like to share uh, um, just just four slides. It, I, I believe you can see them now, and this is from a, a large multicenter study. I've been collecting data in Italy for the OAGB MGB starting from 2014, and this is the paper that is under under review on obesity surgery. So maybe one of you is one of the review reviewer. So please have mercy. <laughs> well, it, it is the the need we had of converting a failed OAGB MGB. and uh, the reason for conversion on more than 8600 patients uh, from all the uh, italian um, ex centers of excellence in bariatric surgery the italian society is very strict in in giving in uh, in releasing the the title of center of excellence because in, for the centers the the follow up must be at least of 50 uh, five years uh, for 50% of patients so these are the numbers as you can see if if we if you add all these all these rates uh, of complication that led old surgeons involved to convert the, their 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 OAGB uh, to another procedure it it it, it it gives uh, a number that is a little bit, yeah. it is a little bit higher than 2% mm-hmm. 
that is the uh, that is the uh, rate that, uh, for example, Cheetan showed us uh, about the the British experience. But this is a, a number that is tenfold higher. So this is, I believe, is interesting for the number and for the length of the follow up. And these are the interventions we have we have used. Uh, there's a lot of Italian surgeons involved, and these are the interventions we have used to convert the the OAGB in in other surgeons. And this is the the diagram of the of the of the complications leading to the revision, and this is the this is the uh, development of the complication during the five years that we found. In, in, in a lot of centers. As you can see, for example, a fistula was a very early complication. Conversely, the, the, the reflux is a complication you, you, you can find even later. So that's all. And uh, this is a just an, an appetizer of, of you, of you, of, of what we, we can find. Uh, I hope this paper will be published soon. And uh, what once again, it is interesting. There is there is a lot of objections, of course, and uh, once again, the only strength we have is numbers. This is the numbers, large numbers that can help us to to define and to support this technique. Are you? Thank you very much. Um, I have just a question. We call the gastric gastric fistula in the early in the early complication, but this is a non-complete divided uh, pouch. This may happen if the technique is not correct. There is yeah. a lot of concern. It, it's not a real complication. Huh? It, it, it can, it, it's early. Huh? You, you detect it very early, and then it's not, not a gastric gastric crystal. It, it is a, it's not a complication itself. It's a non completed. Yes. Yes, I agree, but you have to uh, you have to release, realize that there's some, some wrong surgeries in this series for, for this. The same, the same in the history of. Of uh, Ruin Y gastric bypass. Yeah? Uh, we have, have different, we have real gastric, gastric fistulas, and we have some where not completely divided. Yeah? Sure, sure. <clears throat> oh, it's it's just... a very nice data, very nice data. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, Mario, Mario, how are you? In, uh, I'd just like to bring in Sergio uh, Runa, if I can, uh, from the uh, fantastically named Goodbye Obesity Clinic in Mexico, just to tell us the uh, the, the Mexican experience of OAGB mini bypass, if you would, Sergio. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to talk with you in this panel. And I have been um, doing mini gastric bypass since 2004. After invite the doctor Rulis to Mexico and after see his results in, in the Las Vegas meeting about I decided to do this, this procedure because it was easy and affordable. And then I met Dr. Carvajal and Dr. Garcia Caballero in 2005. And I decided to switch to, to the Carvajal um, one anastomosis gastro bypass. And now we do a, a, little, a little personal technique with both points. And we are proud to do one of the pioneers surgeons in Mexico to do the mini gastro bypass and one anastomosis gastro bypass. At this moment, we have over um, 3,500 procedures already done. We don't have too much complications. We have two reverse and just one um, hippo, the hippo um, nutrition supported and we decide to, uh, to reverse this pain location. I participate with this case in the, um, in the Naples, in the Naples uh, club meeting with Dr. Musella president. And at this moment, I am really happy with the results of the mini gastro bypass and one anastomosis gastro bypass. Any of both are good. Rulers or Carvajal, both techniques are good. There's not many difference, just the reflux valve, but I think that's a work too much. Now let's hear from Dr. Abbas from UAE. What's the experience there? Do you have any comments you want to share with us and the audience? Yeah, Imran? first, 
yeah yeah professor first of all uh, thanks uh, and also it's great opportunity for me to be part of such a great uh, academic team and really i have enjoyed this debate and this is the time we must finalize we must standardize this uh, surgery because this surgery is good surgery so when when this surgery is good surgery we must as a uh, billy uh, highlighted points that as main points we must think about this these are very good points at uh, that billy have standardized we have no standard uh, for uh, mini gastric bypass especially yes for bananastomosis gastric bypass for oagb yes we have standard already pouch size we know so bowel length 40 60 in redo in initial surgery many things have been standardized by carbao and his team but when we see mgb so what is the main issue so we are scientists we must be realistic so if we will not solve the issue and just we see this is political then we cannot uh, achieve the target so mgb oagb is good surgery but we must standardize if someone ask how you do so every person ask different things so this is not so due to this we face um, uh, complications and blame mgb mgb is good surgery if we follow technical points if we standardized these points my i can ask really the future is mgb there is no doubt so progressively now i have started uh, since 2013 definite uh, there was lot of changes in my technique i have changed my technique so now if i compare when i have started at that time that issues that i have faced and my patient faced now much less than that uh, that time so progressively i have improved my technique so but we must standardized so this is just my uh, message sir overall excellent and uh, thanks rs and team and uh, really appreciative all out turn over this time to my coach here ariel we'll see whether you can wrap this up what is except if david has something david Uh no I'm absolutely fine thanks the second half of England versus Germany just about to start so perfect timing and I'll hand back over to Ariel to shut down the meeting thank you All right Ariel it's up to you This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery production I want to thank my co-chair our moderators and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes Register to obtain CME credits for this and upcoming events at cine-med.com forward slash IBC 2021. To view the complete Hot Topics in Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress has been rescheduled to September 19 through the 21 of 2022. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless. My name is Luigi Boni and I'm full professor of surgery at the University of Milan and I'm currently chief of the department of surgery at the Policlinico Hospital here in Milan. The CDGAD system is a system that is being developed for fluorescence guided surgery. The CDGAD system is actually is a step forward. First of all is an ultra HD system so it allows you to have an ultra high definition. and the ultra high definition is maintained also when you're working in fluorescence guided surgery mode and that actually is a big advantage because you don't know compromise the quality of the image because you're using fluorescence surgery so we actually much more precise and precision in surgery means a lot it means preserving structure that should not be cut like nerves preserving vessels dissecting much more precisely remove more 
tumor if you actually were performing cancer surgery. So I would say that the Synergy ID system allows you to perform a better surgery. Some other system actually they have a little bit of a compromising and actually the, the image that we can obtain, uh, even uh, in 4K, they actually are a little bit more uh, artificial, they're a bit more contrast. Uh, personally, I prefer to work with something that actually gives you an image that is actually very similar to the real life. Definitely, I will recommend a Synergy ID system to other surgeons because uh, the, the quality of the image that you are obtaining are actually really good. Plus, you can customize the system according to your preferences. Each surgeon like to have the color on a certain level, they want to have the contrast on a certain level. The Synergy ID allows you to do so. So that is a big advantage. The quality of the image is great, the fluorescence mode is fantastic, so I think it's actually definitely something to recommend. Well, I have to say the Artex was a real surprise uh, for me. Um, uh, it was not really well known in, in the field of, of surgery and I knew that they were actually a, a big company for the orthopedics. I didn't know as big as actually probably was. So the, I'm actually quite happy that I decided to enter in the field uh, of general surgery. The experience is very, absolutely very good. I can see a lot of professionalism going on. They listen to surgeons. That's something the surgeon like. Uh, to have a company that actually is listening to the surgeon, comes to our need and actually focuses their interest also, not just for the commercial point of view, but also for the surgeon point of view. So I think the overall experience has been very good.